Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from the creativepen.com and today I'm here with Dean Crawford. Hi Dean. Hello. <laughs> it's great to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Dean is the international best-selling author of the Warner and Lopez action adventure series, which are super, as well as the sci-fi Atlantia series and other standalone novels. And uh, Dean spans both worlds, so we'll be talking about that today. But first off, Dean, just tell us a bit more about how you got into writing and what was your journey to publication? I um I didn't originally want to be a writer at all. I wanted to be a, a pilot in the RAF. Um, and when I was uh, 17, 18 or so, uh, a medical showed up in my eyesight, the fact that I was colourblind. And for reasons best kept to themselves, the RAF, that's just a big no-no, all over, done. And um, I spent about a year being very annoyed about that and <laughs> <laughs> dealing with it like a mature adult by sulking. Um, and then I looked at my uncle, who was an artist. He paints in watercolours and acrylics. Uh, Christopher Jarvis, his name. And um, he was doing extremely well, doing something he loved doing. He wasn't going to work Monday to Friday, nine to five, doing something he didn't very much enjoy. He'd found a vocation that he, he really wanted to do every Monday morning. He couldn't wait to get going. And I thought, well, what do I like? Is there anything out there I can do that um, would, be, would be rather like that? And, and I saw read read books all the time. I was reading Wil Wilbur Smith at that time, and I thought you know, I could probably have a go at this. I'd always liked writing at school, and and uh, I gave it a go. And I decided I was going to be a best-selling author. And it only took me fifteen years. It was almost overnight. You know, <laughs> it was an extremely long road. But uh, but when I got there, um, I got signed to uh, LBA Books in London, one of the more powerful literary agencies, and. Um, I was then sold to Simon and Chester and Touchstone um, for a really good three book deal, followed by another two books a couple of years later, and that's what really got me going. So what, what year was it when you started and when did you finally get a book deal? I, I have somewhere my first manuscript that's written in Biro, um, and that was 1994, and my first book deal was September 2010, so almost 16 years. Wow. That's really awesome. It's great to hear these stories, I think. I mean, some people might think it's crazy. But it's lovely that you had an artist in the family because that's what I'm trying to be now. I'm trying to be that artist that people know who's doing well. So do you play that role now? I mean, you have kids, don't you? Yes. I yeah. Have. And well, you, do yeah. you play that role to any, you know, other people in the family as well? I think my mum's quite keen on the idea of writing a book now. Um whether she'll do it or not, I don't know, but she's kind of keeps mentioning it. Um, but no, the rest of my family, I'm, I'm kind of half and half. My my dad, my brothers are very practical. Uh, they, they both work for Rolls-Royce, uh, fixing the old Rolls-Royce and Bentley cars, hmm. the engines and engineering. And then we're much that side. My mum's the creative one. I seem to have got a little bit of both of the worlds together. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. And of course, you know, that, that's that sort of journey to publication is is quite, uh, I think it's, a, I'd say common, as in the people who persist for 15 years can can actually make it. But, um, you know, and some would say you then in the end, you kind of won that literary lottery as such. But you're, you're now choosing to do different different things, aren't you? So tell us what's happened since 2010. Well, everything has gone very well on a traditionally published front. But what happened was uh, in 2013, I wrote a book called Eden, uh, which is about a solar flare that takes out all of the world's electrical power and systems. And uh, there's six scientists in the Arctic and they've got to find their way home. And it's just a survival story. And my agent loved it and I loved writing it. I've been wanting to do it for ages. And we sent it out to all the publishers and they all loved it. We thought, here we go, big auction again. It's going to be great. And they all turned it down flat. And the reason was not because they didn't like the book. It was because they were all looking for the next Gillian Flynn at that time, about 2013. They all wanted dark psychological female-led novels, which is fine. This was a dark psychological male-led action adventure story, and they just they, they weren't looking for them. And and we had nowhere to go. And I thought, well, I'd, by that time I'd heard about independent publishing. Everyone told me, you're wasting your time, you won't make any money, it's, it's not going to happen, it's not the future, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose. You know, the manuscript's going to end up on my hard drive, otherwise doing nothing. And so I self-published it and shifted, a, I think it was about 15,000 copies in three months. It was very successful straight away. 
and a little light bulb went on in my head there and it was like well what else have I got on my hard drive here that I haven't published or wasn't right for publishers at the time followed up with two more they didn't do as well as Eden but they did well and I realized that if I could develop an independent career alongside my traditionally published career then you're not living from advance to advance from a publisher you can start to have a more regular income and more control and yeah, it's one of the best things I ever did. It's it's been very fortunate, very successful since uh, since that day when I started. Which is great. And you mentioned their control, obviously, on the type of book you could write. Um, because you know, like you, I mean, obviously, I know you because I read your books and because I love action adventure books. Clive Cussler, Wilbur Smith, you know, yeah. uh, you know, we write in that genre. We're action adventure people. So therefore, I, I of course, um, knew of you. But it, what apart from the control, writing the type of book you wanted, the regular income, because of course, people might not realise that you know, as an indie, you get paid every month. But as a traditionally published author, I mean, do you even know? when the money's coming generally you have an idea the the, the payments are normally broken down into uh, eight to twelve individual segments uh, you get one segment each for however many books you've written plus the fourth for the delivery of that first manuscript that got you the deal in the first place then the rest come as you deliver more manuscripts and as those books are published so it's quite a lengthy process um, three years for my first deal um, and, and while that's okay, I was very one of the lucky few. I did win the literary lottery and got a big deal. Many authors, when you break it down over those timescales, they can't make a living. Yeah. Uh, and so this, this ability to have a regular income bridges the gap between deals, no matter how big or small they might be. And if you can do well and you work hard, it can actually, um, as I know in, in several authors' cases, more than they were pulling in from traditional deals and regular monthly payments, Amazon never misses a beat on, on Amazon Select. I'm fully in with Amazon and well, it's you know, coming up three years, so uh, two and a half years, so I've never missed a payment. No and, problem. and they reconcile to the reports, right? <laughs> yes, and yeah, they give you so much information that you never get from uh, traditional publishers. They give you statements, you get a weekly, a monthly graph with your sales and you can see promotions that have worked and Whereas with a traditional public, you might not hear from them for a year. <laughs> They're just doing their thing. They actually put one of my Ethan Warner books on a special offer for a month and didn't tell me. It's just like, what are you doing? I could have helped you with that. I could have promoted that. I could have got a book bubble or whatever, you know. Um, so there's a lot more control, a lot more direct influence on what you're actually doing. And I think that's... That's invaluable. That's business. That's and so, what what are some of the other sort of pros and cons of of traditional versus indie? I would say the big publishers, the traditional publishers, if you're one of the very, very lucky few, can really change your life. It did happen to me. Most of what I have now is as a result of that, and it was my springboard onto success from there in all things writing, really. But that's their only advantage. It's that one thing where they can get you international, and even now Amazon's starting to catch up with different territories coming in all the time. You can sell books in Mexico and all sorts of places, India as well. Um, whereas the independent route really outweighs it if you're trying to make a living from writing. Um, I can't see any advantages in traditional publishing that outweigh the advantages of independent publishing at this time. Independent publishing, regardless of whether you're wide or fully in with Amazon, gives you so much control, so much more information, so much more feedback. And probably even more important than that is the community's habit of sharing information. You don't get that in the traditional world. Everyone's very closed minded. They you know they don't want to talk about their sales. They don't want to talk about a failure of a promotion that just didn't work. Indies complete opposite. Don't use these guys, it didn't work for me, or at least they're not in my genre. Use these guys. I had a great result from this. I, I, yesterday I found out about a new promoter I'd never heard of who put somebody in the top 100 um, in, in, in almost book pub fashion uh, because they shared that information on an independent author's forum. Brilliant. Mm. And you just don't get that in the uh, traditional published world. It, there's just this mindset that uh, perhaps a bit like people talking about salaries and jobs. You just keep it all to yourself. It's very, uh, very much more sharing in the, in the uh, independent world. 
and which is great and of course of course I'm interviewing you because I, I know you feel this way and it's and it's fantastic but uh, you and I met in person you know at a, a literary conference and there are you know I have felt quite left out at many of these conferences before because of the negativity towards self-publishing Britain's still pretty snobby um, in many ways so what have your author friends like your traditionally published author friends thought of what you've been doing and what are the sort of reactions that you've got from them to start with, when I first mentioned it, I can't remember it, it would have been after Eden ran quite well, so it would have been Crime Press 2014, I guess, and people are like, really? Really? What are you, what are you, you're doing really well, why are you going down that road? And I was thinking, well, business, you know, you've got more than one string to your bow, it's, it's daft not to if it's a good opportunity. And as time's gone on, I've had more and more emails from more and more authors going, you were talking about independent publishing, you know, I'm struggling a bit here, have you got, you know, have you got any advice? And, that, and they keep coming in. I've actually had emails from very powerful authors mm. who are looking to go indie. These are guys that sell in a million a year plus, mm. um, coming to me and saying, how are you getting on? How, how did you do that? How come you're above me in the charts on Amazon and things like this, you know? And you're not on special offer either, you know, this is standard price. And... Oh, I think I think they're coming around slowly but surely. I had a long conversation with one author at Crime Fest um, last year, this year, mm. in May, who uh, really wanted to know how I was doing things, how it was going, whether it was worth it or not. And he's selling very well, so he doesn't need to. But his business mind is starting to think, well, you know, there's something in this. I know so many authors, fully traditionally published, who are now back in day jobs, who weren't two or three years ago. I think there'll be an influx of um, traditionally published authors coming into independent publishing with, with quite a lot of vigour in the next two to three, maybe five years, uh, and they all know what they're doing. They, they all know about their editing, they know about the importance of cover design, so I think it'll get tougher as, as the professional authors start making the switch. Yeah, and that that's kind of the, the flip side, isn't it? Like on the one side, everyone's like, yay, that's really great. The authors are grabbing their rights and doing their thing. And then it's like, but there's going to be loads of people who know what they're doing. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's a double-edged sword, but they will take them time to learn. Um, but as it's a helpful community. Mm. I think, you know, the first couple of books they'll get out. I think the problem most of them have is with speed. They're all used to delivering one book a year, yes. or even one book every two years. Um and at the start, when I started, when I first got my contract, two books a year, Simon just wanted out of me, and I found that really hard going. Mm. Next year, I'll write six, because you just get better and quicker, and you get more practiced, and it does require a lot of effort, and I think that will hold them back a bit, I think, because we all know one book a year independent doesn't really cut it, and unless your name's Hugh, or A.G. Riddle, or something, you know, you, or Russell Blake, you know, he writes about 12 books yeah, a year. Yeah, Russell's that, pretty but, hardcore. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think he sleeps. I, I think he no, must, I've actually, Russell's like going to come on the podcast because I want to ask him about that. Yeah. But but just on that, like you mentioned there, the speed and that you have gone personally from two a year to six a year. So how have you done that? What have you changed to to get better and faster? It's the art of sitting down and writing and just doing it. I'm, I'm a very active person. I find it very difficult to sit down for long periods of time. I want to go for a run. I want to go and do something. Um, and you've just got to do it. I think that's where a lot of people, the procrastination comes in. Oh, I just want to get up and make a cup of tea. I just want to go and do this. Russell, again, good example. You know, you turn off your internet, you turn off your phone if you have to, and you just write. And I went from probably 500 words an hour to my highest at the moment is about 2,500 words an hour. And I'm not the quickest out there by a long shot. Mm. And good words, not 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 just rattling them out as fast as you can, you just get into that flow and that mindset and it just it just works. And, and the method as well of plotting, I used to plot to the nth degree and you'd think that would make you faster, but I actually found it was too restrictive, so I now plot to a fair degree, but also wing it at the same time, a little bit pantsing it, I think they call it, um, just so the ideas keep flowing. And once you get into that mindset, once you get into that zone and you're really kind of focused and that, bang, you can't stop writing. And I often do my 4,000 words before lunchtime each day and then the afternoons for the other things like marketing and notes for the next day and stuff like that. So it's just effort. Mm. Really, it's just effort. All the successful independent authors you see out there, they're all saying the same thing. Effort, 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 effort all yeah. the time. Keep going, keep pushing. doesn't matter if a book gets one starred, 
keep pushing past it, keep going, keep writing your books as if the next one's going to be the next, you know, gone, next Gillian or Flynn. gone girl, or yeah, Gillian Flynn, or, or girl on the train, or whatever, and just keep doing it, and eventually, you know, you get the speed, you get the quality, you get everything together, and, and you start moving forward. Yeah, and let's face it, like the Wilbur Smith, Clive Cussler, Dean Crawford, JF Penn style action adventure is coming back. <laughs> very much, very much. It has to. <laughs> yeah, it has to. It has to. But, but this is what's so great. And I learned this from Anne Rice, the vampire lady. You know, she says she's had three millionaire roles off vampires in her lifetime. I think she's in her 70s or 80s. It's like everyone said, oh, no, vampires are done now. They're done this time. And then they're back. You know, this is a, you know, it's a kind of a, a, a cyclic thing, isn't it? People like different, and I'm over this dark psychological thriller female girl yeah. thing. I mean, I think a lot of people are. <laughs> the thing is, the way the world's changed now in publishing is that before when the, the publishers was the, only, was the only way to get a book onto the market and you could only get a book that happened to be in a bookstore, they kind of had some control over what genres were popular at any one time. Now, if you want to go out and buy a book on vampires and it's five years out of date it doesn't matter anymore yeah. there are always going to be or will always be now a market for your book it's just a case of obviously you've got to get it there yourself um so yeah the the, the genre's in favor only applies now to the traditional publishers you know, it's a very different world it is and um, i was going to ask you then about uh, you mentioned uh, finding out things on forums how did you learn about self-publishing and what are your sort of go-to places now so that people know uh you know where to have a look the main one if you if you're starting out and you really want to learn is probably kboards.com uh, the writer's cafe which is a, a great resource many many thousands of independent authors there uh, sharing a lot of information um, and you can pick up all the basics um, I've simply moved on now into um, private forums with mm. fairly small numbers of authors, mostly independently published, a couple of trads there as well, uh, where we share information. Uh, because it can get a little bit catty out there sometimes on the forums. You know, if you're doing well, I've seen some authors post their success stories and, you know, you kind of get one star bombed and things like that a little bit. So I'm fairly cautious of, of doing too much of that. But keyboards for information to get yourself going, brilliant. Mm. And then you make friends and then you find out uh, all the other avenues to success and web blogs like your, your own joe and, and people like that and mark dawson's facebook campaigns um that kind of stuff where you can learn the techniques to market your books which these days is every bit as much as important as writing the things in the first place because you have to get them out there you have to find a way for people to find those books Mm. the cable would be a number one a good place uh, and so what are you doing for marketing what are you i mean you mentioned that you're just in kdp select for your indie books That's right, although yep. we must say that because you're tr traditionally published you're also on all the other stores right with your traditionally published books like yep. hugh howie i i have to always remind people like hugh's like oh i'm kdp select it's like no you're not once you're traditionally published you're in all the other stores That's right. but yep. otherwise you're kdp select um, so why did you choose that rather than going wide at this point? Initially because I'm inherently lazy on that front and <laughs> I just thought let's just keep it because I was new, keep it to one avenue, keep it simple and, and let's see how it develops and I've just found it to be, for me at least, um, the most successful route. Uh, I haven't tried wide and I know it's possible that you, people say well you go wide you're going to sell more potentially and that, that may be true but for my number of books um the level of success i'm seeing seems to be about par with people that have gone before me uh who i've been in contact with recently about expanding my marketing and stuff because i've done very little marketing in two years and they're saying well you're about where i was two years ago so if you do this this and this you're going to follow the same path or you should follow the same path um and select has been very good to me i have an amazon rep um, one of my books Eden in fact did very well enough for me to get a rep and, and that kind of stuff so I'm quite well looked after mm. um, and also the new Kindle Unlimited uh, version of it KU2 they call it now has page reads uh, and that's proven to be a very successful uh, change whereas before the borrows weren't paying me as much as perhaps if I'd gone wide now I'm getting anything up to well, it's over half a million page reads a month and that really sort of builds up an income that that matches or, or some of just just behind the actual sales so it's a significant increase in earnings for me doing basically nothing extra um so i was very happy with that 
Yeah, and it's good. It's good to have you on the show talking about this because I've recently had Liliana Hart, who is, uh, you know, very, very successful indie, making more money at iBooks, and I'm very pro multiple stores. But it's always good to have the other side. Some and you, how many books do you actually have now? Independently published. Uh, I'm just about to publish my fourteenth. And tradition, so all together. All together will be nineteen. Yeah, so you've got ninety. I mean, you you know, you're you've got a lot of stock. I mean, most people would say when you've got that much stock, you would be looking at multiple platforms because you can go out. You know, there's no point to me going to Kobo or iBooks or Nook if you only have two books, for example. But when you have that many, then sure. But I think it's great to have your balanced view on on KDP Select. Um, and glad it's doing so well for you. And sometimes I do think, you know. I wonder, you know, you wonder because you never, you can never know, right? You can never compare because everything's always different and you can't have a, a, a parallel life where you chose the other way. Um, but let, let's talk a bit, bit about marketing. Um, so you said you weren't doing very much and obviously in KDP Select you have things. So you're doing free days, that type of thing, or what are the other marketing things you're doing? Well, up to now, I've only ever, I've done a couple of book bubs, an ENT, even the news today, Kindle Nation Day, stuff like just random stuff around launches. Um, but over two years, very little. So I've just started doing free books. Um, I've been catching on to things that I should have done a long time ago, putting links in the front of some of my books. I'm giving away one book free all the time uh, that people can click on when they sign up to my newsletter. Um, and I'm starting to use Facebook now, which is if you use it correctly it's actually quite effective because you can drill down so finely to the audience you want to reach whereas with a book pub for instance you're going quite wide lots of random people out there who may follow your genre but may not like that particular star within your genre facebook you can pick somebody who reads books by an author who's exactly like you and and target those kind of authors so that's becoming very useful i find it's an expensive experiment sometimes but but you get the results and it's possible to earn back the money. So I'm very much focused on that at the moment, as well as just trying to buy a little bit of digital advertising every month, rolling countdown deals, which is another advantage of Select. You can drop your books to 99p and 99 cents and still get a 70% royalty. Mm. Um, and just making the most of this backlist I've got now and starting to have something on offer pretty much all of the time. It requires some juggling. Uh, keep track of where, what you've sold and what you haven't sold and and what books do you up next? But um, it's just making an effort on that front now because I've got the backlist. Really, the last two years is just about being about publishing as fast as possible, really, to get that backlist up because I started with just the one book. That's the main point, isn't it? I mean, the, the part of the reason you're doing so well is because you have 19 books. It's not just that you were traditionally published first. Mm. It's, it's, it, Eden did well and it didn't have any connection to my... Ethan Warner books because I hadn't set up a, an Amazon author page or anything like that. It was just out there on its own. So it ran on its own quality, as it were. And now that I've kind of got everything together and I've got all my books under the same name, and I think having the traditionally published books out there and the quotes as well, the things that I can put on my you know, Wall Street Journal quotes and things like that really help a lot. Mm. Uh, but it's, it's another factor of independent publishing, you know. You have to do a bit of maths and stuff, but somebody can sell just 30, 40 books a day at a reasonable price, $3, $4, 3 4 pounds, whatever it might be, and earn a great living from independent publishing. As long as you've got enough titles there or you've got one book that's selling quite well, mm. you're done already. It's, it's very uh, much more accessible to everybody uh, as opposed to the gatekeeper model. Yeah, and what about uh, series? Because I think, you know, that's one of the very big things that indies are hot on is, like, you must write a series. Now, you've got a load of different series, actually, that are quite different genres. Like, I'm not interested in your Atlantia sci-fi, for example. I know, and I love your action-adventure. But you, you're quite deliberately, and you've also got standalones, haven't you? So how is that, have you designed that in any way, or do you just write what comes next in your, in your head? I wanted to do um, something completely different from Ethan Warner because I'd written so many uh, with the Simon and Schuster books. I was, I was up to about uh, seven at the time and I thought I really need a break to do something else. And I'd always wanted to do something like Star Wars or Battlestar Galactica or something like that. And I, I had a good idea and I decided just to put it out there. And it's five strong. It'll be six by Christmas. And it was just to see if I could, just to do something where you're not restricted by the real universe even in terms of physics, you know, you can have spaceships that go faster than light and all these kind of wild, weird and wonderful technologies. 
and I had a blast with it and it's been great and space opera which is the genre it's in uh, that is Star Wars Star Trek was doing very well and still is uh, whereas in sci-fi in traditionally publishing is absolutely rock bottom yeah where they're closing publishers are closing their science fiction arms all over the place at the moment it's, it's quite sad really um, but independent authors are thriving most of the top 100 I guess you know you see three or four maybe five space operas in there at any one time huge following and I thought well there you go. That's what I want to do. It's a good market. Let's give it a go. And in fact, I'm going to start a new one uh, in the new year, a new series. I want to have another great idea that I, I can't wait to get started on. So it's just a case of me writing what I want. But with regard to series, almost invariably, my standalone books don't sell as well as the series. It's just a very consistent rule, I think, among independent publishers at least, and probably t- traditionals as well, that you just got to write in series. You, you draw fans in by writing characters they want to see again. Mm. Just the same reason why people like watching soaps and dramas in America and here as well. They get invo- invested in the characters and they want to see what happens. And sometimes you can't fit all your ideas into one book. So it, it's yeah. definitely the way to go, definitely. Yeah, and I think it, it's the, I'm learning more and more, you know, that it's the emotional promise of the book. Like, you know, I know that if I want this type of read, I can read you know, an Ethan Warner or, a, you know, a Jer- I love Jeremy Robinson's Jack Sigler series, for example. Yep, you know, I, I know I can read a James Rollins Sigma book, you know. And th- there, I know if I want to feel in a certain way, I can read one of those books and I will get the feeling that I want to feel. And the problem with a standalone, and I think the reason literary fiction sells so badly uh, often, or people don't move from one book to the other, is because they can't guarantee the emotional response. No, it's... It's, it's a cosy feeling people get when they, they get invested in a series, be it television, even music perhaps, to some extent, a band, a favourite band. They pick favourites, we all do it. And, and if that favourite you read happens to be book four in a series, they say, oh, I love that, that's brilliant. And you notice it's book four, you're going to go looking for the others. Mm. And so not only an author builds their brand, but it builds a following. And for the reader, as you say, they, they get familiar with it and they they know that once every few months they're going to be able to relive that experience, but with a new tale, a new story. Mm. And it, it just it builds fan loyalty almost and, and reader loyalty. And as long as you can maintain the quality at uh, yes. your output rate, um, you know, you've got fans for life then. And they, they can be quite diehard as well. I mean, oh. <laughs> you and they, they, they just love what you do as long, as long as you deliver what they're hoping for. And that's, that's something else as well is delivering to tropes and, and stuff like that, you know. There's a one particular book at the moment doing extremely well on Amazon, and it is almost exactly the same as a 70s show that used to be on. It's not a rip-off, but it, it's almost exactly the same. And some people are saying, well, that's terrible, you know. And, and 99% of people are going, God, I love that, because that's exactly what I wanted to read. And that's really what it's all about. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you mentioned technology and how you, you know, you love all that. And we've uh, connected over virtual reality and, uh, you know, and you, you love this stuff too. So, um, you know, what, what do you think about uh, the future of story with things like the Oculus Rift and the... St- oh, oh you could, have you got it there? Oh, there it is. Oh, that's awesome. awesome. I wish I could show you and you, you, the viewers, you know, how good these things are they're absolutely amazing so t- t- tell people why it's amazing like what is the experience of of the oculus as someone who wanted to be a pilot i presume as yeah well. yeah i mean i've got um, a microsoft flight simulator on my main computer and, and i can put this on and if you were playing a game like that on a monitor you're separate from it a bit like we are on the screen it, it's just something else when you play a game or do a, a simulation on the rift when you take it off again, you remember it as something you've actually done. Mm. Not just because it's fully immersive and there's no gaps in what you're seeing, but because it fires a different image into each eye, you have stereoscopic vision. So if you're scared of heights in real life, if you walk to an edge of a cliff with the rift on in the game, you'll be scared of the height. You can see the depth and feel the air between you and the ground. It's, and I've done things, um, demos done by, built by the people where you walk out of the International Space Station in orbit around the Earth and it just takes your breath away, the size and scale. So it's like a tire disc. You put it on, the world is the same size. And if you jump off something high, your stomach tingles, even though you're not falling. You're sitting in a seat, but you still feel the rush. Um, and this, these, they're going to change the world to the extent that I've expanded the company into into games designed for, um, for Oculus Rift. I've actually got a... 
uh, a demo up. It's freely available for anybody who's, who's got an Oculus Rift, and it's the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars parked as it was in the first film. Um, and you can walk around it and, and walk into it and, and just kind of experience that as the real people would had it been a real thing. Wow. So where can people find that? Uh, it's on a site called Oculus Share. Uh, so just Google it, you'll see it. It's called Docking Bay 94, which is what it was called in the film, in the original Star Wars movie. I think it's been downloaded, it's only been up a few days, it's been downloaded about two or 3,000 times already. It's doing oh, really Great well. timing with the new movies. Very good, yeah. So I'm developing a game as well on top of all the writing, but I, I do see it as a future of entertainment. And because um, games design is also going independent, just mm. like books have done, just like music did before and, and film before that, um, there are now independent developers releasing games to the public, charging much more sensible prices, reaching huge markets. Mm. Uh, you've seen probably in the news people who develop games for apps on their phones. The guy that did the emoticons for your phone made fourteen million dollars, I think. The scope, because it's independent, because you're cutting out the middleman, just like an author might want to go an independent, is tremendous, and that's kind of why I'm so much into it. It's it's really special. I, I didn't know that. That's news to me that you, you're developing into the game world. That I totally want to do that. That is one, like, uh, you know, I was interested in graphic novels and things uh, as a way into film, but now I feel like the the Oculus and, and you know, virtual reality is going to be even bigger. Like, yeah. that's going to be the thing. Like, And I believe we'll be shopping in VR. Like, we'll, you and I would be talking in VR. Like, people will yeah. be able to watch our podcast chat, you know, somewhere cool, you know that type of thing i mean do you do you see that coming in when like when do you see that coming in 2017 or further on um it's, it's technology catching up with technology almost i know they've done things like taken 360 degree cameras up with the blue angels display team in america and filmed it so you can watch it in the rift uh it's not released yet so they're doing, the bbc is starting to experiment with shooting and cameras that will be compatible with virtual reality as well i reckon they're already doing the next headset. The commercial version comes out next year. It's 2016. They're already working on the one after that for 2018. 2020, I reckon. It'll be... You, everyone will have one because they're not coming out that expensive to start. Oh, I'm getting one. I'm totally there. You've got to get, you've got to get one. Um, <laughs> they're, they're just... As you say, we could, you could, talk in, we could be talking in virtual reality now and people could be viewing this while we're all sitting on top of Mount Everest. Mm. Now you can go and do any, anything and anywhere with these things or sitting in the pyramids having this chat. You know, It's, it's pretty special. And I think um, as far as storytelling goes, they're already making films for VR. Star Wars franchise, which is all shots from the film. Mm. You put it, in the, put it on in the rift, you're actually sitting on speeder bikes racing through the forest and then... There's a, yeah, there's a space battle from the end of Return of the Jedi. You can actually fly an X-Wing. I've got that. That's pretty amazing. All the spaceships everywhere blowing each other up. It's, it's tremendous. I can't, it, it I is, can't and, and you know, of course, to people who aren't into sci-fi listening, it's not just sci-fi racing and gaming. It's also going to be education. It's it's going to yeah. be... It's so, and, of course, everyone talks about the sex thing. There's going to be the sex thing. You yeah, know, but, we've got that covered already. Yeah. There. <laughs> So but they're always ahead of stuff. But I, I do think that um, if, you know, your enthusiasm there, I mean, we're readers, we're readers and we're authors, but the way you talk about that, the way your face lights up, the way that people, like, I'm not even a gamer and I want this. This has yeah. got to, you know, do you think that we're facing, that we have to start thinking about story in these other ways um, and creating worlds that can be put into VR because will, you know, will we lose even more readers to this technology? No, no. I, they, they say that with most new technologies and stuff. I mean, the, the appearance of television was going to destroy the book, you know, mm. and stuff like that. It's a better way of doing it. Like you say, there's educational value to it. Um, I'm working on something my first hopeful game release will be partially educational. People who struggle to get about with mobility, go on holidays, want to see the pyramids, they'll be able to see the pyramids pretty much as, you know, in the right scales and stuff like that. So it has future outside of gaming, although I don't care about that. I just yeah. it. But um, with storytelling, no, I think it'll just enhance it. It'll enhance it. I mean, you've got audio books. We've had books in the past where you can pick your own path, you know, you choose your own decisions. I think it will become something like that where gaming itself will actually become more like storytelling. Mm. I don't think it will kill the book, though. I don't think um, digital authors have got anything to worry about. What I would wonder is whether the Kindle would be viewable in the Oculus Rift. 
um, and then Kindle books and such other media could be enhanced by visuals that would accompany a story, much in the same way as when I was younger, you could read books, but you also had a, um, a Walkman, as it was then, you'd have your, your MP3 player on now, uh, and it would read the book to you with sound effects as well. Mm. You'd have pictures in the book and stuff. I remember those quite well as a, as a child. So you know, I think there might be a crossover, but it, it won't kill the book because there's always going to have to be the authors to write the books. It's not going to be a game changer, mm. um, you know. How, 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 just out of interest, how are you writing a game? How is that different to writing a book? Uh, it's mainly in the... Um, the, the games package, I, I've been using something called Unreal Engine, which is the, the, the engine that is used to build games, and they are hugely complex. Mm. So it's a learning process, and my Millennium Fork and my sci-fi demo was what I used as a process to sort of learn everything. Uh, and it's still not really finished yet, I'm still learning now. Um, and that's something you've got, to, you've got to get through in order to do it, whereas at least an author principally only needs a notepad, a pen, and their time and, and imagination to write a book or to start writing a book with these you've actually got to learn the packages first but they are free believe it or not the the companies that make them make their money on commission of sales of the product you produce if you release it commercially so uh, it doesn't require any financial outlay just a computer powerful enough to run it cool i'm putting that on my my very long list of uh, as, okay. as if we didn't have enough to do <laughs> Well, this is it. I mean, I push myself pretty hard all the time, and I'm now taking this on as well as trying to, to build my career further as an author. But as you say, you know, my face... You love it, don't you? You love that. <laughs> it's quite special. It's quite special. In the summer, I'm out doing something else, you know, outside doing physical things. But when the winter comes and the weather's rubbish and that, 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 <laughs> that goes on, and I use it a lot, it's great fun. Oh, awesome. Well, I'm, I'm going to look forward to uh, doing this next time in, in VR somewhere. I mean, who knows? Um, but, uh, you know, coming back to your books, you have a new book coming out very shortly as we record this in uh, October 2015. Um, Black Knight, tell us about that. Black Knight is based uh, upon something that happened in 1899 uh, when uh, uh, a scientist called Nikola Telsa who's quite well known, father of modern electronics. Tesla. Or, it, Tesla. Tesla. Oh, he's so Tesla. I don't know why. He was tinkering with one of his devices in Colorado and he detected an object in orbit around the planet. Um, this is 1899, before satellites. It's recorded. The US Air Force picked it up in the 40s, long before satellites were launched. And they built uh, a secret base called Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado, almost on the spot where Tesla. <laughs> Tesla? Tesla. See, I did it again. Was, uh, was doing his work and um, I got intrigued by this and so it's uh, a story based around this actual event and, and what happens when this thing comes down. It's rumoured it's still up there. Um, there are photographs that uh, apparently have been disproved uh, by, by some sources. You can actually look it up Black Knight. It's quite a popular uh, conspiracy theorist uh, subject. And Ethan Warner and Nicola Lopez have to go up uh, to the Antarctic, uh, down to the Antarctic to uh, find it when this thing comes down and uh, they discover a lot more there than they were expecting when they arrive. So it's a, it's a good story, one of the classic uh, remote area, something strange happens kind of stories. I have a, have a blast writing it. Oh, super. So where can people find you and your books and maybe other games and things online? Uh, my website is deancrawfordbooks.com and uh, I can be found all over Amazon and Google. I'm very easy to find. Um, and the games also will be uh, soon present on the website as well, um, and the demos for people that own Oculus Rifts and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, deancrawfordbooks.com, easy. Thanks so much for your time, Dean. That was great. Uh, thanks very much.